cylindrical gears. The most common type of gear used in mechanical engineering is the spur gear. The teeth are arranged around the circumference of an imaginary cylinder, also known as the pitch cylinder. The diameter of the pitch cylinder is called the pitch diameter. The pitch cylinders of two gears roll against each other without sliding, so that the circumferential speeds of both gears are identical at the circumference of the pitch cylinder. A gear unit consisting only of spur gears is called a spur gearbox. If the teeth run in a straight line to the axis of rotation of the gear, this is referred to as a straight cut gear or a spur gear. This type of toothing can be produced very economically by gear hobbing, gear planing or gear shaping. With two spur gears, up to three teeth mesh simultaneously. However, at least one tooth must always mesh with the opposing gear in order to ensure continuous power transmission. The more teeth are in mesh at the same time, the lower the load on the individual teeth. With spur gears, the entire tooth width is abruptly engaged at the beginning of meshing and abruptly stopped at the end of meshing. This results in a relatively high noise level. Spur gears are therefore only suitable for relatively low circumferential speeds. Higher speeds and torques with lower noise levels can be achieved with helical gears as described in the following. With helical gears, the teeth no longer run in a straight line in the axial direction, but at a certain angle to it. Depending on the application, the angle is between 20 and 45 degrees. As the gear wheel still has a cylindrical basic shape, the teeth ultimately wind around the pitch cylinder like a helix, similar to the thread of a screw. You only get a straight tooth line if you imagine the teeth to be unwound. This is ultimately the case with so-called helical racks, although the tooth profile in this case is actually no longer helical, but straight. The angle between the unwound tooth line and the original axis of rotation is the helix angle. Helical gears cause the power transmission not to start abruptly over the entire tooth width, but rather the tooth gradually turns into the mating gear. Even at the end of meshing, the power transmission does not stop abruptly, but the tooth gradually slides out of meshing. This greatly reduces the noise generated by the gearbox. However, because the circumferential forces are concentrated on a very small area of the tooth at the beginning and end of the engagement, this results in very high tooth loads. For this reason, several teeth should always mesh simultaneously in order to distribute the load over several teeth. When this is taken into account, helical gears can generally transmit higher torques than straight-cut gears. Whereas with spur gears the tooth forces only act in the circumferential direction, helical gears generate axial forces due to the helix, which can lead to increased wear on the bearing. The greater the helix angle, the greater the axial forces. This must be taken into account when bearing the gear shafts. It must also be kept in mind that the direction of the axial force depends on the direction of rotation of the helical gear. If the direction of rotation of the gear shafts is reversed, this also changes the direction of the bearing force. This must also be taken into account when bearing the gear shafts. When pairing two helical gears, it must be ensured that the helix angles are the same in each case, but run in opposite directions. Analogous to a screw thread, one speaks of a left-hand helical gear or a right-hand helical gear. This designation results from the direction in which the flank rises when the axis of rotation of the gear wheel is vertical. It should be noted that spur gears can ultimately be viewed as a special case of helical gears with a helix angle of zero degrees. This means that as the helix angle decreases, the properties of helical gears become more and more similar to those of spur gears. However, a helix angle of less than 10 degrees offers hardly any advantages over spur gears and is therefore not recommended. In order to combine the advantages of helical gears, higher load capacity and lower noise development, with the advantages of spur gears, no axial forces and lower wear, so-called herringbone gears, are also used in certain special cases. The opposing arrangement of the helixes creates an opposing axial force on each side that cancels each other out. This means that there are no axial forces to be absorbed by the bearings. Due to the relatively long tooth length, very high torques can be transmitted with herringbone gears. However, the complex manufacturing process of herringbone gears makes them very expensive, which is why this type of gearing is only used in special cases such as large gearboxes. Furthermore, subsequent machining of the gearing by grinding is hardly possible due to the poor accessibility. 
For this reason, double helical gears are often used instead of herringbone gears, as described in more detail in the following. In principle, the same effect as with herringbone gears can be achieved by mirror imaging two helical gears. This type of gear is called a double helical gear. The two halves of the gear are manufactured on a common shaft, with a gap in the center for the tool to exit. A double helical gear is much less expensive to manufacture than a herringbone gear. It should be noted that the combination of two helical gears to form a double helical gear is limited in practice due to the need for very precise alignment with the meshing gear. While gears can only provide rotational motion, a rack can also provide linear motion. With a rack, the teeth are no longer arranged around the circumference of a cylinder, but along a straight bar. In principle, the rack can be thought of as an unwinding of the teeth of a gear. The rack can also be thought of as a gear with an infinitely large diameter. In this sense, a rack is just a special case of a very large gear. The flanks of the teeth of a rack are then no longer curved, but straight. A transmission that uses a cylindrical gear, called a pinion, and a rack to convert a rotary motion into a linear motion is also known as a rack gear. Such rack drives are used, for example, in machine tools for moving machine slides. With spur gears, a distinction is made between external and internal toothing. With external toothing, the teeth on the circumference face outwards, while with internal toothing they face inwards. A gear with internal toothing is also known as an internal gear or, somewhat imprecisely, a ring gear. While the direction of rotation changes when two external gears are used, it remains the same when a ring gear is used. In addition, by using a ring gear, the center distance can be reduced while maintaining the transmission ratio. This allows a more space-saving gear unit design. Internal toothing can also provide better protection against ingress of dirt if the gearbox is designed accordingly. The negative shape of the flanks of a gear with external toothing corresponds to the flank shape of a gear with internal toothing. The tooth flanks of an external gear are therefore convex, meaning that they are curved outwards. With internal gears, on the other hand, the tooth flanks are concave, which means they are curved inwards. By the way, between these cases are the racks with a straight flank shape, which therefore have no curvature. The meshing of two external gears therefore results in a relatively small contact area due to the convex flanks. This results in high pressure, also known as Hertzian contact stress. The wear on the teeth is relatively high. On the other hand, when an external gear meshes with an internal gear, the result is a convex concave flank pairing. The contact area is therefore greater, resulting in a lower flank load. The wear on the teeth is therefore reduced. This means that internal gears can transmit higher torques than external gears for the same wear. Although internal gears offer many advantages over external gears, the relatively complex and therefore expensive manufacturing process limits this type of gear to a few special cases. Ring gears are used, for example, in planetary gears, which we will discuss in more detail in another video. In principle, the rotational axes of cylindrical gears can only be arranged parallel to each other. By using bevel gears, the axes of rotation of the gear shafts can also be arranged at an angle to each other. We take a closer look at such bevel gears in a separate video. I hope you enjoyed the video and found it helpful. Thanks for watching.